right button. There we go. Uh, we are speaking with the one and only Mitch Perry. The new single is a very Merry Christmas. And uh, Mitch, as we say in Montreal, bonjour. But we need that because 2020 has been a B-I-T-C-H. <laughs> <laughs> it, that is uh, the correct spelling and probably not a strong enough word. And <laughs> No. But, uh, we, yeah, we... And, and yeah, I mean, that, that's one of the beautiful things about music is it when you're down, it can bring you up. And, you know, it, if I, you know, it's funny you say that. I, I just I saw somebody posted uh, my song on YouTube and they, they said exactly. They go, man, I've been feeling horrible. I don't feel like it's Christmas, blah, 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 blah. blah. But put on the song for five minutes. It will change your attitude. And, and, and it's like he couldn't have said anything nicer to me because, I mean, you know, what, what more power can you have with a song than that to change, change this kind of mood? Now, was was the song that, that you put out, was, was it because of the pandemic and you thought, hey, I need to lift people's spirits? Or were you planning all along, you know, back in March, hey, I'm going to do a Christmas song this year? Yeah, no, it, no. Um, I, I had never in my life thought about writing a Christmas song. And about, oh, God, this must have been out 2007. Uh, I was pounding out some chords on the piano. And, and, you know, a lot of my writing, I don't sit down and intentionally decide I'm going to write a song. You know, I just pick up the instrument and I play and and all of a sudden I'll start playing something that I like and I'll focus a little bit more and and so on and so on until it's a song and it was really weird because I remember hitting these chords on the piano I'm going wow if I was ever going to write a Christmas song this is it and, and, and with that I, I then played the, the chorus chords and I mean, A Very Merry Christmas, which is the chorus, it came out the first second. I mean, you talk about these things are gifts from above. This, th that chorus truly was. Um, and, and so I had the song. And at the time, a friend of mine was doing a, uh, a uh, compilation Christmas album for charity. So uh, can we, uh, you want to put the track on the uh, record? And I said, sure. So we went and recorded it. And it came out so horribly. I, 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 I never wanted to hear the song again. <laughs> and, uh, and basically, we had bought a new piano. And then I started pounding those chords out. And, and my better half says, that's really nice. What is that? Well, it's an old Christmas song I wrote. And I played it for her. And... Uh, we decided then and there that we would record it at some point, and and we uh, we we decided to actually go ahead and uh, and uh, record it for real. I think probably at uh, the beginning of October, you know, <laughs> which is not not normal planning if you're trying to do anything useful with a Christmas release. But hey, th this is how we did it, and uh, I'm really glad we did, you know, because it took a lot of the pressures of doing the things that you would normally do or worry about it. And we just did it for fun. And, you know, and, and I think that really comes through in the track, you know, it's not a hard tr rock track. It's not intended to be, you know, I remember when I was a kid, I used to love listening to those Phil Spector records, you know, with the crystals and the Ronettes. And, and that's when I knew Christmas was coming. When I heard those Phil Spector records, not when I heard jingle bells. And, and so, uh, yeah. I, I I, by the way, I knew it was coming when I heard Alvin and the Chipmunks. That's all. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I will give you that one. Yeah, I'll take that too. Um, but but I like Phil Spector than Alvin, so I went that way. <laughs> um, and, well, his music anyway. Well, of course, um, of course. Yeah. But uh, you know, we uh, the, you, I I kind of think the song evokes a lot of that without being, you know, a Xerox, Xerox copy of it. You know, it, it, it's, uh, it invokes a, a lot of that vibe, but I still, you know, I think it's kind of current, but it's definitely not a hard rock track. 
No, that's a great track. Now, also this year, in March, you released Music Box, which sort of got swallowed up by the pandemic because there was going to be some, I guess, some local club shows and stuff. Uh, talk to me about that album and and putting it out, and then what do you do to sort of keep promoting it and keep it in people's minds, considering that you can't go out and play? Well, well this is the way I'm looking at it right now. I mean, you can look at it as the glass is half full or it's half empty. I'll go, okay, well, let's say life stayed normal. This summer, we, we would have still put that record out, except nobody would have heard of it because every bit of press would have been about Motley Crue and Def Leppard. And, and, you know, and so there's a, a lot more space to maybe get heard, not at the level we'd like to be, but still, you know, we're brand new. And I don't, I mean, I, I can tell it's a huge difference now uh, just in brand recognition with MPG than it was at the start. So I look at it as this is a nice long running jump, but when things open back up, there isn't any reason we can't really re-release this with a real label and a proper commercial push. The music on there is certainly strong enough to, you know, to do that with and this band is incredible live so you need to see you know it's a double whammy and it's a can't miss so I, i'm i'm thinking you know that's really how we're gonna look at it when it opens up we're gonna kind of redo it but at the same time remember even though it's a new album it's stuff that's i've been collecting through the years you know and there's some brand new stuff on it but there's stuff that i've had for a few years just like this Christmas song. And and there's a ton that still exists. And I've already got the second record ready to record. You know, I mean, we're not going to, but right yet. But, you know, I, I would definitely like to make sure we go out once everything opens and, and put music box out there live for people to see. Because it'll, it'll bring a side to the songs that, they probably don't even get off the record. There are a lot of rabbit holes written into the songs that we can go down, you know, to do like jams and play pieces of music that have nothing to do with what was on the record, but it, but they do fit the song, you know, and, and, and I kind of did that on purpose because this band was born out of a Sunday jam band that I had down here in Hermosa, you know, and that's what we do. We would show up, you know, we had a four hour gig and we could play uh, three 45 minute sets. And most, most Sundays it would be two sets with a 15 minute break, you know, cause, cause we went to play, not to, you know, work. When you when you say that the album might be re-released next year on a different label, do you go back and also rework some of some of the songs? Do you say, hey, you know what, this this could use an extra whatever cowbell or whatever? I, you know, probably I don't see doing that with the songs. I mean, maybe for you know, I mean, it obviously depends on who we're dealing with and what their visions are as well, and I'm sure that'll enter into it. I mean, but. My thought is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, let me ask you this, because you mentioned jamming and being able to go down different routes. Uh, one guy who did that very well is, of course, Leslie West. You think of Nant uh, Nantucket Sleigh Ride, and, and when it's done live, it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a gigantic masterpiece. He, of course, passed away uh, yesterday or recently. Um, were you influenced at all by Leslie? Were you influenced by Mountain? Was it? Is this a big loss for you? Yeah, it's a huge loss. Yeah. I mean, if you're a guitar player, even if you're not influenced by him, if, if you're a guitar player and you know about music, you, you know how much Leslie influenced a generation of guitar players. I mean, I'm talking about Michael Shanker. His favorite guitar player was Leslie. I, I have a picture that I was looking so hard to find yesterday, and it was a picture of me, Michael, and Leslie taken when I was in heaven. And, I mean, I look about 12 in the picture. Michael looks 20 and Leslie looks 30. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a really cool picture. And, and I mean, all you got to do is go back and listen 
to Michael's early playing and and listen to Mountain. And there's no secret where he he started to uh, develop his style from. You know, I mean, and he'll be the first to tell you that. You know, so, yeah, yeah it, it's a huge loss. You know, and, and speaking of Michael Schenker, uh, we also lost earlier this year Eddie Van Halen. And I see a lot of Schenkerisms in Eddie's playing, who, of course, Schenker got from Leslie. So it's, so Leslie essentially filtered down into Eddie's playing. In fact, let, let me just quickly, I, I want to ask you about playing with Schenker. But uh, same thing with Eddie. Do, do you, do, man, we've had... I mean, it's a horrible year. Two yeah. of the biggest losses were, were you, uh, I don't know if you, if I can say influenced by Eddie because you came up sort of at the same time, but how do you sort of look at Eddie in terms of his playing? Okay, well, first off, if you play guitar, right, you were influenced by Eddie. I mean, there is no way, I mean, that man influenced a generation of guitar players like no other. I mean, even Jimi Hendrix, who's about the only other guitar player I could put in that same category, when he came along, it was not as big and popular and widespread as rock and roll had become in 78. So when you just think about the sheer amount, I mean, you know, for, you know Eddie basically restarted the guitar industry in the early. 80s. I mean, that's how much of an influence he had. Um, now, it's really funny. Uh, when I first heard Van Halen, you got to remember, we didn't have YouTube. We didn't have, uh, you know, how to do it videos. We didn't have any of that stuff. We, you know, well, we gotta, and, and you didn't even have MTV at that point back it, in the exactly. 70s. You, you know, so you hear these notes and you're going, oh, my God, what's he doing? You know, and you, you sit down in front of your record player, you turn the, t the speed of the turntable to 16, and you try and figure out the notes. And I remember I was sitting there trying to figure out eruption. You can figure out the first couple of triads, and you can play them, you know, with like typical style. But when it gets to that third one, there's just no way you can get that spread. And what was really funny is when I was first, one of the very first bands I jammed with, uh, the drummer had come from New Orleans and he told me about this great guitar player he used to jam with there. And he showed me that tapping trick. And this is like in 75, 76. You know, and of course, the first time you try to do that, you you feel like a fool and go, this is ridiculous. I can't do it. You know, look at how much easier it is to just play the notes. And that's what I did. But three years later, I'm sitting there trying to figure out what Eddie's doing. And all of a sudden, that trick came back into mind. I got what he did. And so, you know, at that point, I started to go all things Eddie. And it could have gotten real dangerous. Um, fortunately at the, at the time, um, we, I was in a top 40 band called the kids and we, we were fortunate enough to play a club where if you were a major band recording at criteria, or you were playing a concert at the sportatorium and you went, Hey, where are we going for fun afterwards? You were coming to where we were at. And during that summer, I became, I mean, I, so many amazing things happened. I mean, I met Ronnie Dio and Tony Almi when they were recording in Heaven and Hell. I got to go down to the studio and see some of that. Um, you know, I also, uh, you know, met Steven Tyler. You know, all these people came wait, through the so, club. Wait, hold on, slow, slow down. You were in the studio while they were recording Heaven and Hell? Absolutely. Oh, uh, oh do, Ronnie, te do tell. Do tell. Do tell. Man, this was the luckiest. I mean, you know, I I was one night, you know, because I, I was playing keyboards even back then, and we had a B3 on stage, and we were jamming uh, Stealing by Uriah Heep, and Ronnie heard me play that. Now, Ronnie, at that point, took an interest. To, you know, I mean, he, he became a really good friend uh, during that summer. And they were, renting a, they were renting Barry Gibbs' house while they were recording. I mean, he had me come over to the house. He had me meet all the guys. You know, I, there was never any kind of official thing made. 
but I know that Ronnie and Jeff were not the best of friends. And I think Ronnie was like, hey, second keyboard player, guitar player. You know, that, and, and I think the first time he even said something, Tony, Tony laughed him out of the room. But, um, you know, I, I did get to be there. I remember picking up Tony's guitar and I had no idea about his fingertips or anything. And his guitars are strong. I mean, they're like eights on everything. I, I couldn't play it and keep it in tune. But, you know, I mean, it, it was amazing. I got to do that I, the same summer. I spent a lot of time with Pat Travers and was uh, around for a lot of uh, Crash and Burn. And Pat Thrall is who actually got me my first gig um, out in California. I got flown out here in 1980 by Alfonso Johnson, in which uh, the drummer in the band was Vinnie Apice. But Pat Thrall was watching me play... And he's telling me how great I'm doing all the tapping stuff. He says, but I got to stop doing it because I'm going to get to L.A. and I'm going to look like every other guitar player. You're going to look and, like a wannabe, right? Yeah. And, and you know, he was 100 percent right. And, and and to that end, when I went out to L.A. in 1980, even though everything Eddie played and recorded subsequently, I'd hear I go, oh, my God, I got to go learn that. I try not to because I didn't want to become a copycat. Not because it's the most amazing stuff still to me uh, done on guitar. There's Eddie and there's everyone else. But I, I didn't want to sound like Eddie, you know. So I, I you know, I, I'd sit there and try and figure out things, but without really working them out. And so, so maybe bits and pieces filter into your style, but you're not xeroxing what they're doing you now, know you, um, you just mentioned pat travers and i was literally about half an hour ago listening to pat travers covering ufo doing the song lights out and it's a it's a brilliant version you it's it's you can sort wow. of I'm, a, I'm gonna look that up yeah it's 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 i got it right here look at this it's a it's this compilation. Whoops, there you go. UFO CD. We got uh, Pat Travers doing Lights Out. You got John Karabi doing Only You Can Rock Me. Uh, Paul Diano doing Shoot Shoot. Bernard Shaw of Uriah Heep, which we mentioned, also doing Natural Things. It's, it's it's a great little package. But uh, let, let let me just quickly talk. You played with Schenker because I'm on a Schenker rabbit hole. So, uh, you know, uh, tell, tell me that story. How, how did you and Michael get together and play? And how crazy was it? Uh, well, <laughs> all of the above. Um, first off, I was managed by Lieber and Krebs when I was uh, in the band Heaven. And we were recording Knocking on Heaven's Door, and I was playing the keyboards on that. And Michael was in the studio. So we became friends, uh, you know, and he saw that I played keyboards. And let's fast forward a couple of years later. Um, I had quit Heaven. And I had come out, moved back out to L.A. to try and put a band together. Um, and I hadn't really found a singer I liked um, and hooked up with Pete Way. And, and he was auditioning guitar players for Wasted. Um, we went down and played, but we ended up hanging out a lot more than we played. And, and I, I was at the Oakwoods with him and, uh, and Johnny D, his drummer. And Shanker shows up, and he he's in town to finish mixing the uh, and record and overdubbing on Perfect Timing, and he hears I'm in the pool. He comes over. He says, ah, "What are you doing? Ah, just you know, looking for a new band." He goes, "Well, you know, we're looking for a keyboard player, a guitar player. You want to think about doing that?" And I I don't want to play rhythm all night. And he says. You do all this weird tapping stuff, you know, because once I started playing with Billy Sheehan in Dallas, there was no way I could look over, at the, you know, what he's doing, you know, I, and spend the rest of the night after the show trying to figure out what the heck it was. Um, but so I got in a bunch of weird tapping stuff that I was doing. And Michael says, if you do that and don't sound like me. He says, I think it'll work because people want to hear that. I don't do it. So as long as you don't play like me, you know, this might work. I go, wow, 
Well, cool. He goes, well, what are you doing right now? I said, swimming. <laughs> he goes, do you have a guitar nearby? I go, yeah, there's one upstairs. He goes, well, go get it. Let's go to the studio. And I literally got out of the pool, got my guitar, got dried off, rode with him to Sound City. Um, Andy Johns, who was producing the record, and Olaf Schroeder, who was part of the German management, and Robin were all there waiting for Michael. And he shows up with me and says, hi, this is Mitch, and uh, he's going to try the guitar solo on Give Me Your Love. And he asked how crazy Michael was. You should have seen their three faces. <laughs> they, they all look at him like he's totally lost his mind. They're probably trying to figure out what drugs I'm trying to sell them. And, uh, and they take him out of the room and uh, disappear for about a half an hour. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, well, that was nice while it lasted. Uh, but as it happened, uh, we came back in. I uh, came up with a pretty cool solo for Give Me Your Love. I mean, we did that fairly quickly. I think it took less than an hour. And uh, I did a couple more things on the record and then joined the band for a couple of years. But for me, it, it was a dream come true because, as I mentioned earlier, my two favorite guitar players, bar none growing up, were Jimmy Page and Michael Schenker. Jimmy for his composition and Michael for the way he made that guitar sound. Yeah, just just real quick, I've always felt that that Schenker is underappreciated by the masses. When when we talk about you know great guitarists, you've got a lot of folks in North America that'll say, oh, you know Ace Frehley, the way he bends a note, and then you know, oh, Eddie Van Halen, uh, and and I find Schenker is sometimes left out of the conversation. Do you feel that too? And and should he be like one of the top three mentioned all the time? Well, I mean. Honestly, we, we we get to a thing where, where it gets, I mean, for me, I don't know if there's a top three or a top five or a top ten. I mean, for me, there's certainly, there's Eddie and, and, and Jimmy and guys like, and Jeff Beck, and, and, and they're just, they're, they're in a league of their own. And then there's, I mean, guys like, you know, uh, Joel Hawks for today. I mean, he's just a phenomenal, phenomenal player. I mean, pound for pound, you know, he, he can hit with any of them. But, you know, there's so much more to it, To uh, you know. Like, are you writing songs like The Rain Song and Cashmere and, you know. I mean, I'll trade in a hundred of those licks for one of those songs now. So, you know, I, I don't work, you know, I, I guess I don't put so much credence in who's first, who's second, who's third. I mean, I, I think. No, no, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. And yeah. uh, before I sat down with you, I was interviewing uh, Jeff Pilson, of course, a foreigner docking. And uh, I declared their album Black Swan uh, Shake the World as the best album of 2020. But it has, of course, Robin McCauley on there. So I've had two two interviews with Robin McCauley being mentioned. So uh, how do you see him as a singer? One of the best, right? I mean, that perfect timing in his vocals, right? Right. Well, I, I got to tell you, his singing on this record is brilliant. It's always been brilliant. It's as brilliant now as it ever was, if not better. And my hat, well, except for the Santa cap, is off to him. Um, you know, it, it's... It, I, I was really, really proud to hear him sound so good on that record. I, I it, it was probably one of my favorite records of the year too. Um, it's funny. I, I I know in 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 a list, I, I'm going to come out on top, and they're coming out in number two on someone's list. So I'm like, I don't know that I agreed with that, but I hope I get to number two on your list. So. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, but hey, anything that has uh, that has Robin McCauley on it is is, is great, uh, and of course, uh, a very uh, Merry Christmas is uh, well. You can go find it on YouTube, and uh, Mitch, always always a pleasure. C'est toujours un plaisir. Likewise, uh, you know, um, if you uh, get a chance to uh, definitely uh, check out the video to a very Merry Christmas on YouTube because. 
That, that was a story in itself. I mean, we we did everything so late we couldn't find anyone proper to shoot the video. So it was a uh, experiment in learning how to make your own video in a day and a half. And All right. turned out great. Listen, it turned out great. I got it right in front of me here. Here, I'll, I'll click play on it. Look at that. There you go. <laughs> With all the kids and the trains and all that there. Oh, hold on. I got to turn it off because all I hear is the music in my ears. But there you go. Thank you, sir. Merci. Oh, can you still hear me? Uh, oh, yeah, I can hear it. Well, oh, well I, didn't, I didn't recognize the French. Thank you. Oh, sir. there you go. Well, yeah, so, yeah, of course. I actually, you know, it's funny. My dad raced cars when I was a kid. And yep. We used to go, we used to, used to go up to uh, Mont Yep. Um, in fact, he, he won the support race for the Can-Am there in 69 and, uh, and finished second at the Grand Prix in 68. So, um, Yeah, and Mont Tremblant is... Uh... About 45 minutes north from me. Oh, I, I know exactly where you're at. Yep. And, uh, and uh, what was funny is I used to have to stand by the car and I learned to say, no touche pas, si vous play. <laughs> if anyone got too close to the car, you go, no touche pas, si vous play. And uh, that's what I did. That's what you did. You know, uh, years and years ago, when I was 18, 19, I was the uh, security guard at the Montreal Grand Prix, the uh, Formula uh -huh. One. And I was in charge of what they called the false gate, the fausse gris, which is where you pull it open and let the cars go. And the first day I showed up, I didn't have any earmuffs or earplugs. And they said to me, don't you want plugs? Uh, I, I don't I'm like, nah. <laughs> I, I, Plugs? Who needs plugs? And those bloody Grand Prix, whatever, Formula One cars just buzz now, by. Now, which year were you doing this? Uh, I was 18, 19. So uh, we're looking at uh, 90. No, hold on. Uh, yeah, 90. Hold on. Uh, let me do my math. Uh, 80. Hold on. I was born in 68. So 88 is uh, 20. So about 86, 86, 87. So oh, you heard some really great engines. I oh, mean, I, I, yeah. They, they, they don't sound like that anymore. I mean, they 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 they're not the same. And I mean, and, they're way faster and way more powerful. But because of the hybrid stuff and everything, those engines. I mean, you had the screaming Ferrari V12s and the Matras, and you, and you could tell each car sounded different as it went past you. They're all. And, all really unique and and that gate was in the hairpin turn so i would let them all on they'd go off and then you'd hear them screeching around on that hairpin and i had no ear protection and i was like oh smart move tough guy smart move tough guy <laughs> yeah, well you'll know what to blame your tinnitus in later years Ooh, on. but let me tell you i got those earplugs after that because oh, yeah. uh, i did one day of that and i just went Okay. Well, you know, all I've ever done for a living is play uh, play guitar or teach race car driving. And, you know, I, I say I've spent a lifetime being around loud guitars and loud race cars, but I'm still I'm still convinced. You need to cover the song like Loud it. Guitar, Fast. What was it? Loud Guitars, Fast Cars and Wild Wild Women. Right. That's the song. Yeah. Loud yeah. Guitars. Yeah. Uh, well, I know that uh, I know that Schenker with Contraband did it with uh, Bobby Blo It was Bobby Blotzer, Tracy Gunn. Sh was that an original or was that a yeah. cover? Yeah, Cher, Cher Peterson was playing bass. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Contraband did a song called Loud Guitars, Fast Cars, and Wild Wild Women. And I don't know mm -hmm. if it was an original or a cover, but listen, you should probably do it. It's, it's pretty much, <laughs> it's autobiographical. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Thank you, sir. Have a have a happy holiday, and uh, we will do this again soon. Merci. Thank Look you. Look forward to it, and uh, and thanks again. You have a, a great Christmas, and we'll yep. talk soon. Cheers.